Well, my children both went to the school and in my final year of my degree, um, I was interviewed by an inspector from Staffordshire in Burton at the old Guild Street um, offices. And he said, you will have a job somewhere in Staffordshire in September, but I don't know where. And then two weeks later, I had a phone call one morning at 10 past nine from Mr. Hayton, who was the head then, to say, can you come round to the school, lass? And I rushed round thinking there was a problem with my children because I'd just dropped them off. And he said, I've got a job going in the reception class. Would you like it? I'll give you a couple of weeks to think about it, if you like. And that's how it started. And so what did you think about that? Well, I mean, what did you think of the school when you obviously moved into the area? What was the school? Was this the old school? Then, the no. School? When um, we first moved to the area in 1970, my son wasn't at school, but my daughter Samantha was. And um, she was at the old school, um, which was, of course, a lovely setting and very different from Leeds, where we came from which was a sort of, um, not an inner city school, but it was a, a modern school. Uh, and we thought it was lovely. And then they started building the new school, and my son was one of the first intake there. So he was, um, we, we were pleased with the new school because it was lovely. But, uh, he, and so that's how I became involved. The children were there, and then I decided, um, I'd, quite, I'd always wanted to teach, and I decided I would, uh, when my son started, that I would ring up the university and say, do you offer any courses that would be suitable for um, someone who's married with children? And they said, no, but come and talk to the Dean of Students and see what we can offer. So I went and for what I thought was just a chat <laughs> and uh, they wrote back and offered me a place. And so uh, I couldn't drive then, so I had to quickly learn to drive. I had three months to learn to drive. <laughs> And uh, so that's how it all happened, really. So obviously you've been there for a long time. Yes, it will. A, next year will be 40 years. 40 years. So yes. 40 years. Now, this is a massive question. And what was it like when you first started there? How, I mean, we can't say how things have changed because 40 years, a lot mm. have changed. But if you could paint a picture of what life was like at All Saints School when you first started there. Well, when I first started, there were only three of us. In the school there was me uh, a miss naden who was i was the reception she was the next teacher and uh, and joy row um and we were the only ones because the that it was just the infants key stage two or the juniors as they were then were all up at the old school and so uh, so it was very different it was a much smaller school we didn't have things like teaching assistants um there was just one secretary um, worked there so it was it was a very small community really and, and now uh, reception children are being pushed to be ever more academic what what was a, a typical day in terms of lessons like at, when you first started what sort of things did you do with them I think we did everything that we do now but we weren't so prescriptive and we were led by the children's needs we weren't being pushed by government or by um, outside agencies who were just dealing with figures. And I think that was the difference. If it, I, I could, For example, one day a child came in with an elephant's tusk, a whole elephant's tusk, and said, my daddy said, would you like this? And we did a week's work round this. Now, arguably, you couldn't do it nowadays. Because you've got a plan and you have to stick to the plan. Yeah. And I, I am involved with training a lot of students. And that's the one thing I notice. They can plan to the finest detail. But you watch them teach and they miss an opportunity yeah. where a child, you could have taken it off there because they don't want to go off plan. And that's yeah. the big difference. I and I think that intuitive teaching is a very important part of teaching. When, when I was doing my training, there was a, I read a book called The Philosophy of Education by a man called Dennis Childs. And he said, in teaching, it's important to be flexible, but you have to have something to be flexible with. And I think that was very true. I think we've gone slightly the other way now. Yeah, there's a fear, isn't there, now, of going off script, I think. Yes, there is. Which is very sad, I think. And, it, and I think sometimes that... Um, 
sort of played by a fly. Yeah. It's to the detriment of the children sometimes, yeah. which is so that's the big difference really. You were telling me about uh, the head teacher, Mr. Hayton, who was there. Could you re recount that story for me about? Yes, his... he um, he was a very bluff Yorkshireman. Could you, sorry, if you could start say by saying Mr. Hayton. Okay. Say because. The, um, I'll chop that bit out okay. about me talking. Thank you. Well, Mr. Hayton was the first head. He was a very bluff Yorkshireman, and he called all the... Because it was only ladies who worked there. We, uh, no, uh, Mr. Shear was at the junior school, but he called us all lass. It, um, and he was a very plain-speaking man. He actually said to me one day, I'd been um, doing some work with the reception class, and we were doing subtraction, because we'd done addition, and they were getting quite good. And when he saw my book, now it was a record book rather than a focus book in those, a forecast book. So you wrote down what you had done that week. And I put that I'd been doing um, subtraction. And I was called into his office at the end of the week. Uh, um, and he said, right lass, he said, um, I noticed you've been doing subtraction with them. I said, yes. He said, don't push them too far. They're only babies. <laughs> And that was typical Mr. Hayton. We never, we didn't see him very much. He never came out of his room, never came into the staff room. Didn't do assemblies. Um, he was a whiz with a screwdriver. If something fell off the wall. Um, but basically, that was, it was him and us. Um, and then uh, when, when he decided to retire, he decided to retire because he said education was going in a direction he didn't go into it for. Uh, and so he and his wife retired at the same time. And the governors, I was a governor then, and we decided to get um, Delise Sanders, who lived in, still lives in Mill End Lane, uh, who was an artist, to do a picture for him. We commissioned a picture, a painting, of um, all of us. And uh, he refused to accept it. Because he said, I don't want any fuss. He said, I just want to go. Um, and so he wouldn't accept he was, and the night he left, I'd worked with him probably for about um, five or six years, and I knocked on his door just to say, wishing you all the best. And he said, don't come in, lass, I don't want any sentiment. Um, so he was a, yeah. only once did we get him to come into a Christmas concert, and he was actually quite overcome with emotion. And afterwards, I thought, I saw a different side of him. I thought, mm -hmm. that's why he doesn't come out. So who followed him into the head's chair? We had um, a very different head then called Mrs Morris, who was uh, very tiny. And on her first morning with us in September, all the staff were in, in the staff room. And uh, by that time, the juniors had moved down as well. We'd had the extension built, and so the whole school was down there. And so we were all in the staff room, exactly the same staff room as we have now. But we were all in the staff room and she sat at the end and she said, I would like you all to know that when decisions have to be made, I may ask your opinion, but in, at the end of the day, it is my school and it will be my decision. And we were all a little bit shell-shocked, really, <laughs> after Mr Hayton. Um, but she was very efficient. Um, you couldn't falter on that. She gave us all a huge file and said, that is the curriculum you will teach. Not sure it was ever opened, but <laughs> by anybody. Is that something she produced or bought Yes, in? no, she produced it herself. Okay. Um, but she, that's the way, she likes things done her way. Yeah, yeah. But she was very efficient. Um, so uh, she was quite different. She didn't stay terribly long because her husband was a headmaster and they moved to, he moved to Wales and so uh, with his job and so she went with him. So would it have been Mr Hayden after that? Was he the next one? Or Hadden. 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 Lyle Hadden. Lyle yes. Hadden, of yes. So what was he like? I mean, I knew him, but tell me about Lyle. Yes. Lyle was what you might call a culture shock after Mrs Morris. Whereas if you went into Mrs Morris's room, there would be one file on the table, or one sheet of paper she was dealing with. When you went into Lyle Hadden's room, there was a whole heap of papers and he could never find what he wanted. And he had, he had a system, Delisle, that every so often he would clear his desk into the bin because if it was important, they'd write again. So he was a very different kind of headmaster. Um, I mean, unfortunately, fairly quickly he started to show signs of illness, 
which, and I think the school suffered during that period uh, from lack of leadership. And it, it, what it taught me is how important strong leadership is. Um, because the, the atmosphere in the village and in the school was, was quite tense. Um, during that time. Has the, the relationship between the school and the village changed much over the years that you've been working there? What, sort of, what is the relationship like? I think in the early days parents rarely questioned the school's decisions. Um, they were more accepting. As I'm sure my mother was when I was at school. If the school said that's what you did, that's what you did. Now it's very different. I think education is more out there and I think also, rightly or wrongly, parents are told you must do this and you must do that or you mustn't do this and you mustn't do that and um, they will readily question the school's decisions so you have to be prepared and equipped to justify your decisions mm. which is is right in a way we should be we should be justifiable yeah um, sometimes maybe a little bit too much yes well it, it's very difficult sometimes because we're making we're making decisions for educational reasons and parents are making much more subjective decisions because it's their children, which are understandable. We all do when it comes to our children. We see things differently. And do you think the children have changed much over the years, the children who go to, to the school? Yes, I think they have. I think the children now, the children we have now have probably been, um, had preschool education from a very early age. Whereas when I started, and, and for quite a long time, you know, it was parents who dropped them off in the morning. Um, and they came into school much more, um, not necessarily more educationally ready, but they were socially ready for school. Um, you know, they'd had a lot of play. I think that, that that's when we go back to what we were saying earlier. Now, it's all about, I think there is something intrinsically wrong about telling a parent when a child is three your child is not up to scratch because we all know that by seven that situation could have changed tremendously um, but parents get stressed by that uh, because they think it's it's a sort of a reflection upon them and their parenting did you have i know there, there were some links with um well it used to be step uh, before it was stepping stones it was nursery and play yes. group what, what links did you have with the nursery school at the time? Well, actually, we were very lucky because there was a, an initiative that I think Paula was instrumental in developing to try and get those links, stronger links, between the, the preschool and the school. And so for about two years, um, we, we set up an initiative where I would go every so often and I would spend half a day with the preschool. I used to go f to evening sessions where I'd talk to parents so that I got to know them and then we started that the half term before the children started at school um, I would have them in with their playgroup helpers for the ones who were starting would come for half a day a week to get to know me and I got to know them and so that by the time they started they were quite familiar with it um, and so we had quite, and I think we had a good relationship and our children were invited to their Christmas concerts and summer concerts and, and I used to go to the, the play group uh, summer party and present the leaving books and things like that. And it was lovely, it was a lovely relationship with them and I enjoyed that uh, tremendously. It seems to become more business-like now, doesn't it? Because the stepping stones has to make money at school, That's has right. to justify itself and make money as well effectively. Yes. So. I think that's strained the relationships, yes. maybe. But I think there are times when, you know, perhaps sometimes we have to say, well, which is important? You know, if it's important to build up those relationships to start with, perhaps we ought to try and make it happen. Mm. I'm going to ask you a specific question. I interviewed Richard Kirkland. Oh, yes. <laughs> who said he hated school with a passion. Not because of any other reason that than he, he just wanted to be out yes. doing things. Do you remember teaching? I do Richard? remember teaching. Could you tell me yeah. what it was like? <laughs> yes. He was he was a very quiet boy. Um always very polite, very quiet, did as he was told, never put a foot wrong. But it was always very obvious that um he wasn't sort of 
that wasn't his favourite place to be, shall we say. <laughs> but he was certainly not, he wasn't disruptive or anything. He was one of those children who knew he got to come to school and he put up with it. <laughs> he told me he, he, he used to hate sitting on the, on the dais, the yes. dais that you had. Yes. And he had great pleasure when they remodeled the room and yes. came in and destroying that. It's yes, <laughs> yes, I bet he did. Yeah, it wasn't anything personal. He said he just no. he couldn't see the point of it. No. Are there any, um, I know it's a huge question to ask, but are there any standout moments that sort of leap to mind about maybe it's particular children or members of staff or things that happened in school, trips or visits or just, just nice things that happened that you can particularly jump to mind. I know it's a huge Well, one question. of the very early ones is I took the reception class. We'd been, our, our topic had been dinosaurs and I took them to Matlock Bath because next to Gulliver's Kingdom was a big dinosaur park, which was, I'd been to, to look at it and I, and I knew it would be good. And, but as part of the day, we went to um, Gulliver's Kingdom as well and had a wonderful day. It was a day very hot and sunny. And on the way home, it was very quiet on the coach and it was before the days of seatbelts, so that was always a nightmare on the journey, making sure the children were all in their seats. And because it was very quiet, I went down the coach and every child was fast asleep. Everyone. <laughs> and they slept all the way home. Oh, bless them. Um, but, I mean, they, in 40 years there have been so many. Yeah. I mean, I do, I feel very privileged that I've had so much involvement. For example, at the last school disco, a young man, one of our dads came up to me and he said, hello Mrs Faircliffe, I bet you don't remember me, do you? I said, I do, it's David Westwood. And he said, fancy you remembering me? And I mean, that's the thing, I mean, now you must be teaching I grandchildren or possibly great children. No, it's children. Just children. Just now, children, yes, children of people I taught. Because of course they were five when I had them. So now it's, it's their children. And, uh, and so uh, there's quite a lot, every class now, there are, there are children who come and say, you taught my mum or my dad. <laughs> and you taught, of course, reception for many years. 25 before, years. Before you moved yes. around, yes. didn't you? So how did I you mean, the interesting, the, the interesting thing is <clears throat> that in the first, I would say the first 20 years of my teaching, nobody ever watched me teach. Apart from the first year, somebody came in, an inspector came in, um, and never watched me teach. And uh, so, and that's the difference now and then then it was we we then had a teacher a head teacher after lyle hadn't left we had a head teacher called bernadette hunter who was again very efficient she's now the um president of the national association of head teachers um and bernadette was very efficient and she said to me i'd like you to i was then the early years coordinator so she said i'd i'd like you to take over the literacy and would you move to key stage two and and um, I spent a summer going round every Roman site in England because I knew I had to do the Romans. And the one thing I was worried about was the computer, computer skills. And the teacher who was leaving, who so was very good at it, said, what you've got to remember in year three, try the tack. You know, I wonder if anybody knows. She said, there's already somebody who knows more than you. And she was very right. So I thank her for that. Um, but... Uh, it has cha it's changed tremendously. Um, not all for the better. I think it's harder. I think it's a much harder job now. And I, and I do think, I, I strongly believe that that side of the teaching, which is a craft, they all know the science. You know, they know how to plan. They know what all the standards are and all these sorts of things. But there's the other side of teaching, which is a craft and which is about children. And I think that one really needs to be yeah. reinstated. It's all about results now, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is. Especially I mean, when, when Ofsted pay. come, that's all they look at is the data, and they what they they try to find what the data tells them. Changing tax slightly, I've got some lovely films, and you will have seen them because Quentin was involved mm. with them. The the case of the disappearing chalk yes. and so on. Can you remember? Can you tell me how that came about? Who I set can. it up? And, and well, any memories the, of it? Yes, it was Liz Bates and Pat Shear and I and um, Liz was one of those inspirational teachers who just made a connection with children when when my son went into her class I wasn't sure how he'd cope with Liz because he was quite quiet and when he came home the first day I said uh, how do you get up with Mrs Bates oh he said she's great and she said she can shout louder than you 
So he, that was it, she'd made a hit with him. And Liz wanted to do the drama. She was very good at drama. She would write our Christmas plays. Pat Shear was one of the most inspirational teachers I've ever seen. He was an amazing man. Um, he got the results, but he had the relationship with the children. And uh, it, we decided, we, there was talk about it, because Quentin and I were involved in the drama, about having a drama club. Well, we'd run it on a Saturday morning, because you, you couldn't do it after school in those days. We ran it on a Saturday morning. And it wouldn't be allowed nowadays. We'd take the children over Witchner Fields and, and all sorts of places. And, um, and John Colston got involved, which I'm sure you've got on the film. And it so was... who decided to make them into films? Was Quinton the he was the film choppy, was he? No, he wasn't. No. It was it was in the early days of video cameras. Do you remember when there were huge things? And uh, the school got one. We we got a video camera, and so I, I think it was Pat Shear who wanted to do the who was keen to film it, and of course the children thought it was wonderful. And in fact, in those films, I know the ones you're talking about because James Walker. Um, after Quinton died, gave me some copies of them. He put them onto CD for me. Yeah, yeah. But that was that was like a history of the school. Mm -hmm. When you looked at the classrooms, they were much duller than they are now. My impression, at looking at photographs of the school during the 80s particularly, is it, it looked a bit tatty. Yes, it did. As well. Yes. Well, it had the old wooden desks, mm -hmm. which were getting very tired, because it had been open... It opened in um, 1972, so it was... They were getting quite the tatty by then, the wood, and everything was, was brown and dark and hard floors, there weren't carpets. And so uh, when I saw those films, it struck me how colourful the school is now. Uh, <laughs> and what do you remember of the village generally? Because again, I've got some film of the village in the 70s, and it, it, you know, a lot of buildings were quite tatty and dirty as well then. I think it's, we see it as a, quite a... A clean, bright, well-kept village now. But do you, do you remember how the village has changed over the well, years? Well, I do. And also, I mean, there were, there were at least three working farms in the village when we first came. And I remember driving to school in the mornings. And Tom Meller, who... We lived at that time in Essington Close, and Tom Meller had the farm just at the back of Dark Lane. And uh, he would be driving his cows down to his field, where Meller Close now is. That was his field. And uh, in the mornings, he would be driving the cows. So I just had to sit behind him and wait until the cows had gone. Well, you can imagine the state of the roads. So it has changed quite dramatically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there any, um, I mean, you've mentioned some members of staff like Pat Shear, who I think everybody remembers. Are there any other members of staff or pupils that particularly, I mean, pupils is a huge ask, because there are hundreds of them, aren't there? Any that particularly spring to mind that you remember? Gosh. It doesn't matter if you can't. No, I think, huge, I yes. think there are just so many of them. Um, and so, I mean, there's, there's a, a lovely story. A little, there was a little girl called uh, Kirsty Gould, whose children are at our school now. And I remember when Kirsty first came to school. Um, it, it was the beginning of her first week. And uh, it was playtime. And she said, uh, I said, right now, he's going out to play. And she said, come on, Mrs Faircliff. And I said, oh, it's not my turn. And she looked at me and she said, oh. And she went outside. I meant it's not my turn on yard duty. She went outside and she came running back and she said, you're all right, there's nobody there, come on. <laughs> and it's those sorts of little... I mean, I, I've, Quinton used to say to me, you ought to write these things down. And Gervais Finn has done exactly that. Um, and when I hear his stories, they are... They're not, they sound outrageous, but they're not. They are exactly what happens. Yeah. Uh, I can remember the, the, the nativity play when Mary and Joseph walked on the stage and Joseph sat down on the stool. <laughs> Mary was left standing holding the baby at the side. And when my son was one of the kings in the infant nativity play, he was the third king. And as they were going up the, no, he was the second king. And as they were going up the steps with their gifts, the king behind him, who was David Croshaw, tripped. Jamie fell into, he fell into Jamie. Jamie fell into Adrian Allen, who was the king with the gold. And so all three of them sort of landed on the stage in a heap. A comedy moment. <laughs> they they were, yes. Yeah. And there are so many. And, and they still happen now. You know, these, um, I mean, now, in I think in key stage two, you have a different relationship with the children as well. Um, and I enjoy that now. 
I enjoy that sort of, you can, you, their sense of humour is more sophisticated. And I think the children are generally much more sophisticated now. Um, well, they have far more what worldwide experiences than 30, 40 years ago, don't they? All the foreign travel and absolutely. experiences, yes. you know, sort of going out and events yes. and activities they yes. do. Yes. Well, yeah. I, was, I was just listening to um, a radio programme about Laurie Lee, and they asked him about the, the changing nature of village life. And he said, well, he said, in my youth, in the summer, people were out in the village. He said, nowadays, they want to watch EastEnders or Coronation Street. They've got television to watch. He said, we didn't, so we went out. Mm. Um, and I, I think, talking about changes in the village, you know, the village hall was quite a... I know it is still quite instrumental, but, you know, that was really quite important because pe not as many people had cars. So our first involvement with amateur dramatics was in the... Well, my first one, Quinton, was involved in Leeds before we came. But So what was your involvement with the Drama Society? I know... Well, to start with, Quinton, as I say, when I first met him in Leeds, he was involved on the technical side of their drama group. Then when we came to Auroras, um, the very first person we met was Audrey Hall, because Audrey was involved with a group called Welcome Wagon or so, and she came round to, to tell us about the village and things. And when Quinton said he was involved, oh, she said, we've got a drama society. And so she got him involved in Litchfield. And he also got involved in all of us and he um, did acting and technical and did the lighting and things. Um, and then when the village hall was refurbished the first time round, Quinton took on the role of coordinating it. And I remember the whole family, my son says he can remember, being round there painting the village hall. Uh, you know, everybody had to go. And we got a group of people and used to go around. But there was a great feeling of community there. And the, and it was ours. We had ownership of it. Um, I don't think people realise that they own the village hall. I mean, no. We, we try very hard to let people know that. Yes. Um, and one thing I find sad is, you, even in the summer holidays, you don't see... Hundreds of children playing on the play equipment no. in Walkfield. No. When Maybe. when I first got involved with the village hall, it was because um, I took my son to play group because he was two, and um, they as soon as they found out I was invo I'd been involved in a school, they said uh, because I was a teaching assistant in Leeds, they said, "Oh, would you come and help?" And so um, I went round to help, and we'd had a complaint from the village hall committee about the playgroup children and I was asked if I would go to the committee meeting to defend us basically and the complaint was it was it was taught the, the complaint was it was just a written complaint about the children causing vandalism and these were children from two to four so I went round and the complaint uh, and one of the ladies on the committee who I actually became quite friendly with afterwards was Richard Kirkland's grandmother and uh, she was, and I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying, she was she, she was a little bit like the Ina Sharples of the Village Hall Committee. And uh, they said, and I said, well, what exactly is the vandalism? And they pointed up to above the windows and somebody had written a series of four letter words up there. And I said, if they could write it, they couldn't reach it. And they sort of said, oh. <laughs> So it didn't occur to the little four-year-olds. No, but from that point on, I was on the village hall committee, and so I became. And then with the the Oral Dramatic Society, um, I then became chairman. And so, do you remember the process that, that sort of uh, they went through to to do the original refurb? You know, when they built the toilets in the back. Were you were you yes, part of that? Yes, then? Brian Hall, Audrey's husband, was an architect, of course. So he drew up the plans, and. Um, we got Robert Douglas from Douglas Concrete, who lived locally, came and gave us some money to, to help do it. And it was some of it was done by workmen who were brought in because they had to, and that's when the kitchen was built and the toilets at the back. And the stage was moved to the other end. When I came, this, when I first came, the stage was um, at, at, the, at the opposite end. And so uh, it was it was quite different, you know, when we I can remember making the curtains uh, for the stage and uh, well and the hall as well. But the stage curtains were huge and uh, I can still remember how heavy they were. 
Um, but we had great fun there. And, and I'm glad it's still going on. I'm glad there's still a thriving dramatic society. Because we then, we then moved to Litchfield and became very involved in Litchfield and Shakespeare in the Park, the Operatic Society. And then Quinton um, directed the Panto in Litchfield at the Civic Hall for 17 years. So we were very much tied up with that. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, so I still have a great attachment for Good. Well, well you, the Village Hall, you know we're, we're sort of closing it in September for refurbishment yeah. so that's it's taken us a long time to get that it is back. yes because that's that's from the 70s the early 70s that's right 75 I've got it's, the yes it's of, taken all that time and for the last oh, probably eight years it's been in debate whether it gets knocked down move here there and everywhere but we have finally now got the money to do the first phase so <laughs> it's it, onwards and upwards is it going to be extended or is it we are because there's not much room to extend no we're it? going to knock down the um I can do my work at home. I couldn't do that now because there's too much paperwork that requires records that I haven't got at home. So it's changed tremendously. I think the schools, I mean, I've, as you know, done little projects in there and had the three lads go through there. Mm -hmm. I think we're very lucky to have it. Yes. And I think sometimes parents don't appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And if they were to go and see other schools and realise just how how good All Saints is. Yes, I, yeah. I've said that sometimes to staff, you know, when they, if they've had a little grumble, I've said to them, you, I used to go and do some work for the LEA in schools in, in Tamworth, in very poor areas, to try and raise the reading standards. And when I, on the odd occasion, if our, our staff have had a little grumble, I've said to them, you go and work, you go work for six weeks in a school that's in special measures, then you'll know what pressure is. Um, and when I went, I went to Amington Heath School, and I mean, that was sort of, I actually felt very humbled by it because they were in special measures and what they did with those children, their nurturing was just second to none. They were amazing. And yet they'd constantly got on Ofsted at them because they weren't getting the right standards. And I said to the head, it is obscene that their school was measured against the same yeah. well, criteria as our the backgrounds school. they come from. They 